So, Jenny? Thanks so, yeah, thanks so much, Brian. I'm going to put into the chat the link to our past webinars. Uh, the last one that we did was one that, that I um, did, which was on chronic uncertainty. And of course, that uncertainty hasn't waned. <laughs> it's only increased. Uh, as we deal with the pandemics and the election results. And uh, this is, this is an, an interesting time that we are living in. And I, am, I think it's more important than ever, number one, that we all make sure that we're taking good care of ourselves. That's been a theme in many of our webinars that we've sponsored. Uh, but you know, number two, that we be there for each other and support each other through these really challenging times. And we've got to, an all-star lineup today to talk about how to take an appreciative approach to service learning with some of my favorite people on the planet. And uh, I'm gonna, gonna hand it over to Alicia Nelson. But before I do, um, you know, one of the great things about our Office of Appreciative Education that Amanda and I love the most about the office is that we have this opportunity to work with really talented graduate students like Brian Hirsch and Janelle Freire. I see you on there and, uh, and Alicia and Alicia, was uh, an intern in our office starting late in the spring and really was instrumental in helping us put on the Appreciative Advising Institutes this summer. And she has a, a passion for service learning and was really happy to be able to connect her with uh, one of my graduates from the University of South Carolina, Erin Conkle, who is on uh, the panel today. And Alicia is getting an opportunity to do an internship also with Erin. But we are just so surrounded by really talented people. And that's been true throughout the history of the Office of Appreciative Education, both here at Florida Atlantic and at the University of South Carolina. So I just wanna give a shout out to the many, many graduate students and undergraduate students that have played such an important role in advancing this work on appreciative advising and appreciative education. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alicia Nelson, who is going to introduce our panelists. So Alicia, thank you. Hi, thank you, Jenny, I appreciate that. Um, yes, we have four of us panelists who are gonna talk about appreciative, um, service learning, civic engagement, how we put into place in our own institutions um, through an appreciative lens. Um, I'm gonna have each of you introduce yourself. Erin, if you wanna start. Sure. Hi, I'm Erin Conkle. I am the Director of Civic Engagement at Wellesley College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I've been doing this work for uh, almost 15 years. Amazing, Jimmy. Hello everyone. I am so excited to be with all of you today. Um, so I'm Jimmy Walters. I am the director of Catholic Scholars and Residence Ministry at St. John's University in New York. Um, I've been involved in campus ministry since 2006. I'm a proud graduate of the Institute. I think back in 2012 or 2013, I'm now in the Appreciative um, Administrator course. Uh, and so I just am so grateful to, to be with all of you today. And my pronouns are he, him, his. And Pete. Hi, everybody. I'm Pete Mather. I use he and him pronouns. I'm at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And if you um, don't know Athens, Ohio, you may have been looking at the Ohio electoral map recently. And there's one small blue dot in southeastern Appalachian, Ohio, and that's Athens, Ohio, where Ohio University is. And um, I'm a professor in the higher education program and department chair in counseling and higher education. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. My name is Alicia. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a graduate student for the College Student Affairs Master's Program. I'm in my second year at Nova Southeastern University. Um, this time last year, I was a graduate assistant for civic engagement. And um, due to the pandemic, I wasn't able to return to South Florida. And so now I pieced together my um, 
my work with three different internships. I am an intern at Nova Southeastern University uh, with their alternative breaks program. I'm an intern with the Office of Appreciative Education, which I started back in May, and then I asked to stay on it because I loved it so much. Um, and I'm also working with Erin Conkle up in Wellesley with their civic engagement programs, uh, which you will hear a little bit more about in a little bit. I love service and civic engagement. I always thought that I was going to be a social worker. Um, and then as I was as I was working in the nonprofit world between undergrad and graduate school, I learned that I really love education and I love uh, college students. And I think that college students are going to be the ones to change the world. Um, and then as I was searching for how I can work in higher ed, I realized that you needed a master's degree for a lot of the positions that I was interested in. Um, and I went through this search of trying to figure out how to get into higher ed. Um, and everything that I do kind of resorts back to how do we give back to our local communities and what does that look like? Um, and so I've been doing this work for the past 10 years in a multiple different ways. Obviously this year it looks different in a lot of ways. And a lot of our institutions have needed to kind of pause, reconfigure, figure out um, how this year is gonna be different. And so what we're gonna do with our panel is allow each of us to describe how our programs have changed and shifted over this past semester, what our plans are, what we're really grounded in, how we use appreciative education within our work. Uh, and then we're really gonna open it up to you all, hopefully with the last half hour for questions. And we will answer as many and all questions that you all have. So feel free to continue putting your questions into the chat box. Um, and we will get to that probably in about uh, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna start with Pete. Great. Thanks, Alicia. And I'm I'm assuming that a lot of people here do know about appreciative, appreciative education. Um, what I'm going to be doing is, um, unlike the rest of the panelists, is talking a little bit more about just the connection between appreciative education, kind of in theory, and, um, and community engagement, service learning, and then that'll be sort of a backdrop for, for the other panelists. But I'm always grateful to participate in activities with the Office of Appreciative Education. Um, and so, like I said, I'm going to give you some basic ideas about the connections between appreciative education, appreciative service learning, appreciative engagement or community engagement. And then, um, so, so I'll, just to start, I'm going to start with the point that appreciative service learning grows out of a model we call appreciative education, which grew out of appreciative inquiry. And all of these appreciative frameworks include models like the 60s and appreciative advising, the 40s and uh, appreciative inquiry, but importantly, they're also about a way of being or a frame of mind and fundamental to the, that is, I'm gonna kind of kind of point out these, highlight these two ideas. And the first is um, we use language like flourishing and thriving because we believe in the attainability and the power of high aspirations. And appreciative inquiry um, uses language like life giving and high point experiences in community engagement. We can think of both of the, these terms in regard to our students' experiences and outcomes, as well as the experiences and outcomes of the communities we're engaging with. And then the, the sort of second big idea is, is um, that appreciative education is based on the idea that we can succeed when we leverage what is already working on our strengths. So some of you do appreciative advising and you know that um, working with students and highlighting their strengths and their high point experiences are important. And, and those are more of a focus in an appreciative approach than thinking about fixing problems and deficits. And oftentimes we're naturally drawn to fixing problems and we take identi our identities from those things. So, with that in mind, um, when we're thinking about communities and communities in need, we often go to go to certain communities or people and and serve because there is a problem or a need, and we should acknowledge that um, 
it's important to acknowledge that the solutions to these problems are already present in the communities that we're working with. So some of you may know the model of working with um, high poverty communities called asset-based community development. It's very consistent with the ideas of appreciative education. The ABCD model is about surfacing and leveraging the good, that is the assets that are already present in the community. So for instance, rather than coming in to teach people in an urban community about how to garden, we recognize there are gardeners already present there and we can lift up their asset strengths and skills that already exist. And we might, for instance, help connect people in a community rather than import somebody from outside who's an expert. Um, and then there are also teachers and leaders available within every community. And it's important to acknowledge, understand, and validate that in our work with communities. Then another related idea is that learning enrichment, learning and enrichment that come, come from our interactions in these communities in a in both ways, it's, it's a, there's mutuality. We recognize that in any relationship, both parties can be enriched. So we're careful about saying things like, we are going into a community to help, period. And so, and I believe the opposite of that is also not quite right. That is, I'm going to learn just from the community, but not help or teach. So I think a healthy alternative is understanding that in any relationship, there is appreciation that both parties can grow from being in contact with each other. So we might say we're going into a community to be in a relationship with, to grow together through our engagement. And then, so what kind of underlying this is, is a sensitivity to our language use around, um, around our work with communities. Then related to this pre previous idea, um, I, I learned from somebody who, who works with a, an organization here about an idea of, of thinking about our engagement with communities as doing for, doing with, or being with. So there are these three ideas in which the model is a little bit different in terms of how we engage um, with the communities. So the latter two, that is doing with and being with, are a little more enlightened and more consistent with an appreciative approach than is the first. So again, those are the first being doing for, and second is doing with, and the third is being with. And then finally, I wanted to mention an idea that relates to the foundations of appreciative inquiry and appreciative advising, um, that we can use the structures of the Ds in our work with communities. So whether we use four Ds or six Ds, I'm gonna give a couple of examples here. Um, it's helpful to sometimes incorporate these ideas and these models when we work with communities. So. Some of you know the first D in appreciative advising, appreciative education is a disarm approach. And so with the community, that might mean beginning a relationship by highlighting that the relationship and the dignity of the people are more important than say, the single project that you're there to do. This might mean beginning a relationship with the community by playing games or having structured get to know you activities or highlight some artifact from the different cultures that are present. Um, could be taking deliberate steps to understand the gifts and assets of the people and their culture. This might occur through also through asset-based interviews in which a team asks about the best aspects of the community. This, this is actually moving from disarm into discover, which is a second D, but so doing something like asset interviews in which a team asks about the best aspects of a community or the people within a community that make a positive difference. Um, and the D cycle can also be used in an effort to assess a community engagement department, center, or program. That is, you know, looking at within your own department, what is working here? Where are the really good connections and relationships? And what, where have we actually really helped faculty, for instance, in designing service learning programs? And what, you know, so what has worked in leveraging those and learning those things in order to dream and then design and deliver a, um, a strong program. So I will stop there. And I think Jenny, Jimmy is up next. Thank you so much, Pete. And thank you for, for laying that um, backdrop and background for us. Uh, what we're going to do now is get into some more of the practical nature of, of how we're um, living this out on our campuses. And you know, Jenny spoke about the this time of uncertainty and you know it's been such a difficult year 
And one of the things that I, I say to my students often and to my colleagues is this spiritual principle of when all is lost, serve. And I like that because I think it invites us, it invites our students to identify their purpose. It invites them to, um, to transform them, their own lives, but also transform their communities. And so what I'm gonna talk about today and very briefly is just give you some insight into this current semester of working with my uh, first year seminar. So I oversee a faith-based scholarship program. And the, one of the great parts of it is that I get to be their instructor in that first semester. And they'll be together for four years, but this is a great opportunity for me to, to get to know them and to instill uh, really this appreciative mindset. And so in a normal year, I'm, I'm relying heavily on the Appreciative Revolution book. Um, I have a book called Dreams Come True, Discovering God's Vision for Your Life. And I use that to help the student transform their lives in the idea of discerning their career and discerning their major. Um, how are they developing spiritually? How are they developing as a leader? Uh, but this year presented a whole different challenge because when we went to figure out our academic service learning, the partners that we did not have, um, the partners that we usually had, we did not have. Um, they were still trying to figure out how to exist within COVID because of, of the high numbers we have here in New York City. Uh, and so I took this appreciative mindset and said, let's take this approach with, the, um, with that service learning and using the Ds to invite the students to identify the population that they felt called to serve and then to do something. And, and we're in the process of doing it. So I have some at the end of this to give you some updates. And so just to, to give you a, a brief overview of this, uh, so in the discover step, I always in this class, I'm inviting the students to discover their gifts and talents, to name their strengths. But then it was inviting them to discover that population that they wanted to serve. So part of it was research, was looking into statistics and learning about the, some of the issues that we have in our city. And you know, I give an example with food insecurity and housing insecurity in New York City. Those numbers are rising to um, the level of the Great Depression, and that was pre-COVID. And so we, it's a major issue. So how do we engage our students in that? Um, and then researching agencies that they wanna partner with, building new communities and new community partners. And that is really the, the opportunity that we have at this time where we're being challenged to reimagine our, our partners. And what our students have been able to do this semester is identify some of those new partners um, that might be fruitful in the future. Uh, the other part of this was, having them discover um, other leaders to inspire them. So because this is a spirituality lens to it, uh, I put before them Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker and was a leader in um, the, the right for women to vote and then during the Great Depression um, and until she died in 1980. I also put before them civil rights uh, leader Ruby Sales, who asked that great question, where does it hurt? And helping people think differently about injustice. And then also uh, Frederick Ozenam, who was a college student in the 1800s, who founded the St. Vincent de Paul Society that is now a, a global community that serves their local communities. Um, and so just inspiring students to say, well, here are how some other people have transformed their, um, their lives um, by transforming their communities. And so that's all a part of the Discover step. We had them kind of just name, do this research and start to name the population they wanted to serve. And then it moved to the dream step and asked them to dream big. What could they do over these 15 weeks? And then I wrote it down and invited the students to match themselves into a small group to be able to um, have similar minds. And so I think we had seven or eight groups of about three or four students each. And they all had a similar focus on the population that they, that they wished to serve and to be with. Uh, and then it moved into the design stage and they created these plans. And then I met with each of those groups and said, okay, we really can't do that, but we can do this aspect of it as anyone would do in an advising role, just to um, help the student plan and to be strategic. And again, having a, uh, a small window to do this uh, and then to put it into action, the delivery stage. And the, be the blessing I have is that I work with them for this semester but we have them for four years. And so in their sophomore year, the whole focus is on social justice. So we will build upon what starts in this first semester. Uh, and I just wanna give some examples of what the students have delivered. Uh, and this is you know, still a work in progress for some of them. And I, I joked earlier, there's still one group that's scrambling to do this. So their first year students there, 
um, they're figuring it out themselves. But what we're about to share is really some some innovative and some some uh, really good work. And you know, one group worked with an agency in Manhattan that provided um, packaged meals to bring to those who are homebound, who can't go out and buy for themselves, and they can't leave, especially because of COVID. And so they were able to wave through a window or see someone like at the doorstep while being able to remain safe, but also to make a difference. Um, a number of letter campaigns to veterans, um, to the elderly, uh, connecting with a nursing home. And what was nice about this letter campaign was it didn't just stay in the class. They offered it to the larger university community to help other students who were looking to do their academic service learning to jump onto their project. So that was, that was wonderful. And then some um, ways to make blankets, to make masks for COVID, make toiletry bags that included disinfectants and connecting with local shelters. And so they were able to bring their, their groups together and to use their time to make those things. Uh, and that leads us to what would be the, the final weeks of our semester in that don't settle stage and inviting them to reflect on what happened um, from a spirituality level. We'll, we usually ask the questions, what did you see? What did you hear? And what did you feel? And then if they're comfortable, we would say, where did you see the face of God? So that's that because they're a faith-based group, we can go there with them. Uh, and that is where the transformation happens for our students. Uh, when they're able to reflect on those questions and begin to um, hopefully feel inspired to do more. And then, as I said, starting in sophomore year, we move from this level of charity, which is what we're doing, to a place of justice. So where are the ways that we can start to um, address systems and begin to, through their, their careers and their life, make a difference so people aren't relying on that sandwich or that drink, that we're able to change systems um, based on, on their gifts and their talents. And so I am uh, really thankful that we had this opportunity to do this semester. And I probably will continue with this model moving forward because it's, it's just so much more rich than going to um, just say, go to the academic service learning office and find you know, eight hours of service. This is inviting them into something much more rich and much more deep. And so I'm going to stop there. And I think I'm passing it over to Eric. Is that right? Nah, -uh, Alicia. Alicia, I'm sorry. Alicia. <laughs> And actually, this is um, Justin's thought in the chat actually transitions into mine really well for the active citizens uh, continuum, which is what we use at Nova Southeastern University with our alternative break program. So we um, are quite new. We were still within our 10 year mark of creating this alternative break program at NSU. And that's where I spent most of my time last year in my graduate assistantship and where then I continued an internship this, this year. Um, and when COVID hit and we realized that we probably wouldn't be traveling, we probably wouldn't even be going off of campus if students were even on campus, right? Um, my boss and I were kind of like, what do we want this to look like? Do we want to develop a new program? Um, and so we pitched an idea to our students, which was super watered down. Um, we were just gonna have like a conversation about a social issue for an hour. And we were hoping that our students would lead that. And our students came back because they were already hired um, as, as site leaders. And they were like, absolutely not. This is not alternative breaks. We want an alternative break experience. So Conchetta and I were trying to settle our students were not allowing us to settle, which is our last D in the, in the phases. Uh, and so then Conchetta and I had to go back for two weeks and try to figure out, first of all, like, why are we doing this? Why, why do alternative breaks matter? Why, do, why does service in general matter? Um, and it really was, the, the answer for us was really this active citizenship continuum um, that, that Justin's talking about. And so it's really moving our students to, to understand who they are within a social movement, um, how, what their, their role is, um, and, and turning them more into a, a conscious citizen, into an active citizen, where they're really looking at the root problems within a social issue. Um, and that's really the goal of what an alternative break is. And so then how do we get to do that in a virtual way? And we did it where we have um, three different sessions where we're engaging our students in education and reflection, um, where we have um, 
some good diversity and social justice conversations. We're asking for full engagement. And then also this reorientation um, process of figuring out how we take what we learn both in the classroom and within our program into whatever we do outside of the classroom. Um, and so we separated into three different um, days. Uh, they, the days focus on first, what? What is our social issue? And then, so what? Why does it matter? And then now what? what? Now that we have this information, how do then we use that within our lives? Um, and we separated these days out over three weeks. And so we have a two hour session where the students really dig into whatever topic they're talking about. They invite uh, their own community partners that they have created relationships with. They encourage the students who are participating to find their own community partners with whatever local area they're in because a lot of our students aren't in the South Florida region anymore. Um, and then throughout the two weeks in between those three weeks, those three, three days of those three weeks, uh, we give them a list of ideas of service to be engaging in. And these service ideas are either virtual, things that you can do at home, um, or things that people can do in person if they're comfortable. Um, and so that's how we've really developed our Alternative Breaks program um, to, to harness the people who, who really wanted to still do service, participate in social justice, and activate them into this active citizenship continuum. Justin, I would also love to continue talking about this, how we have done ours and what your ideas are as well, but I'm gonna turn it over to Erin because Wellesley's doing some awesome stuff as well. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so for Wellesley, when, when March happened and we sent our students home as did most institutions around the country, um, my team took a minute to pause and it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that the models that we had used to program pre-COVID were not models that were going to work during COVID. Um, we evaluated our programs and thought we had one out of 14 that was possibly able to work in the fall. Um, and so as a team, we stopped and said, okay, we could certainly not program in the fall. We could wait and see what happens with COVID. Um, there were options on the table. What we ultimately decided to do was to really rethink the way that we did our work. And so um, we have two new pilot programs this fall that we are running. One is um, a class-wide program. So it's for every sophomore at Wellesley. Uh, most of our sophomores are on campus right now, but will be transitioning off campus for spring. And they will be self-selecting their own projects that they will do in whatever community they find themselves in during January. Um, in something that we have rather non-creatively termed the January project um, based on its time of year. Uh, but they're gonna spend January and then for many of them post-January engaging in projects that they self-selected and really immersing with their peers in that reflective process. Um, this is sort of a moment of pause nationally. We're looking at you know, a movement for racial justice. We're looking at a time that's testing our democratic institutions in ways that we have not seen um, in decades at least. And so we really encouraged our students to do the same. We didn't think about output necessarily or quantity of work. We really focused on quality. The second program that, we, um, that we're engaging in is called our Scholars Program. It's for juniors. Well, it starts with juniors. It's students will stay with us similar to Jimmy's program. They'll stay with us as juniors and seniors. Um, we have 40 students in that pilot and it's a civic leadership intensive. So they have a number of components that they're working on, um, but really the central piece we structured around community. So they are in small cohorts um, where they meet weekly with each other to provide support, to really get into that space that Pete talked about of being with each other. Um, and then they are also branching out into their own communities. Our juniors are predominantly away from campus right now. Um, and so depending on kind of their own circumstances are doing that work either virtually or in person um, in their own communities. They're bringing in coursework, internships, leadership experiences. We've engaged um, our alum network in some pretty significant ways. 
um, Wellesley's tagline is that it's the most powerful women's network in the world. Um, and we have had our alums really support our students through this in some incredible ways, um, who also saw an opportunity to pause and engage. But I, I wanna go back to the appreciative mindset because I think that's where we've really tried to focus in the ways that we're engaging our students um, and really helping them understand that the core of this work is being with, it's showing up. Um, we're seeing that right now, you know, our, what's been apparent to me over the last week is that our democratic institutions are incredibly fragile, but they are so rooted in trust and showing up for each other. Um, when you think about poll workers, ballot counters, people who stood in line for hours and hours to vote, um, election watchers, all of that makes our democracy function. And it is all based on the principle of showing up. Uh, I'm going to tie in something that Jimmy said as well, and this is a reflection that came from one of our scholars. And Jimmy asked, you know, where does it hurt? And we had a scholar who just reflected and she said, I usually think about times like this as giving until it hurts. And she said, I've stopped thinking about that and I've started to think about how do I give until it stops hurting? And I think that's what we're hoping our students are able to do to really embrace each other, to hold each other, um, and I think that for us is really the crux of civic engagement and social change. So I'll stop there um, and I think we're going to questions. That like really hit me, Erin, um, your discussion with your scholar. Um, I think that we've all kind of done, been into this transition of what, what truly matters and how do we give back in a way that matters. Um, and I think that that's a question, honestly, that that service learning has been trying to answer in general since its beginning is how do we do service that that do, has a positive impact on the communities that we're serving. Um, and, and sometimes that's hard because our our service that we're doing many times can be short lived. Um, when a lot of times social justice work is a longer experience, a longer commitment um, that we're asking students to do. So how do your programs engage more in the, so attempt to engage more in the social justice side of things instead of just the charity of service learning? I can start. Um, I love the mission of Partners in Health, which is a, um, a public health organization that was co-founded by one of our alums, has a line in their mission that says, um, you know, this work is about solidarity, not charity alone. Um, and I think the way that we help students get there um, and the, the way that we talk to them about the work that they do while they're with us for four years is that the types of changes that they are hoping to make um, and movements towards equitable and just societies don't happen in four years. They don't happen in single elections. They don't hinge on single candidates. Um, what we are teaching them are skills that they are gonna need to take into their careers and leverage 40 years of a career to see the changes that they're hoping for. Um, and we get to that pretty quickly because our students tend to be high achievers. Um, many of them go out into their first community experiences and come back and say, I engaged in the prison industrial complex for four months and it looks the same. Um, and we you know, then introduce that conversation of it. You're not gonna see that change in four years. You might not see it change as much as you want in 40 years, but every step is one we have to take to get there. Um, and so doing the work now, showing up now is important and meaningful and knowing that progress um, isn't the enemy of perfection. Progress is how we get there um, and really helping them see that that's a necessary part of the work. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna respond to, oh, sorry, Jimmy, were you gonna, oh. I, I was just gonna say, I think as much as you can, and, and Alicia, one of the things you said is so much of what we do is going in for like a one spot you know, like a one shot kind of thing. And I, I think it's really important to as much as possible have an ongoing relationship with 
people, communities, projects, people mostly. Um, and while students often can't do that, there is at least somebody, whether it's staff or faculty member that, um, you know, stewards an ongoing relationship and is able to interpret that relationship for the students who may be newly coming into it. And, and you know, I, I just think, and while I, I'm not saying that one shot events aren't sometimes valuable, but I'd say prioritize those things where you can actually do some kind of ongoing relationship work as part of, you know, kind of underlying the projects. And I would just add, I think one of the things that we try to do is invite our um, students to be as, as, to learn as much as they can about the injustice, to learn about the issues, and then kind of prepare them to, um, with a toolkit to make a difference. And one of the ways that we have, we have done that is we partnered with some different agencies. Um, like we work very closely with Catholic Relief Services, which is an international organization, um, but they are such a gift to us because they offer all these different free trainings. And so the students are able to um, learn more about how to lead to some change. And so while the, we, we have to develop those relationships with partners, it's also developing that toolkit that they could take with them, as Aaron said, beyond these, these four years. Yeah, definitely. I think um, something that the appreciative advising model um, allows us to do is it creates a framework for how we're able to build relationships with others, both within our community setting and the students that work together, but then also our community partners that we're working with and our local communities that we're working with. Um, and I think there was a question in the, the chat that asked, um, is, there, is there a list of, of things that students can do remotely and um yes there is right like there is a list that that you can search and google and and try to find um i use because i'm an alternative breaker um i use breakaway which is a national organization that connects um uh, colleges with with community partners across the across the world um and they have had some really good resources for virtual service um and at the same time, I think I would um, suggest really creating those relationships, right? What is your what is your community need, um, or what what would be beneficial within your community currently um, that then your students can participate in and building those those relationships. Um, with that said, service looks a lot different currently than what it used to. Building relationships looks a lot different than what it used to. What we've been experiencing at NSU is um, that a lot of our community partners have been going through a lot of um, shifting within their own staff. Um, and, and so a lot of our, our relationships that we had built up, we actually don't have anymore because they were laid off, because they were furloughed, because they were the person was lifted up to another position, whatever that reason was, um, we no longer have that person relationship that we once had. Um, and so what does that look like? I would actually, if, if you all have found ways to develop those relationships, um, Virtually, I would encourage you to type those in the chat so that we can all kind of share our wealth and knowledge because I'm sure you all have been working to do that as well. Um, but is there anyone on the panel who would have some um, suggestions and advice to building these relationships while we're virtual and what service might look like? I know we had a few examples. I would just add or just say that I, I guess we're finding that agencies or partners are struggling and you know, as you said and that they don't have the resources that they once had a lot of our partners have, have closed down in the past mm -hmm. six months and so for those that we have a previous relationship with it's finding out who is that point person and to use the, the dream question or the discover question to allow them to go through that process and name what how could we help you how can we support you uh, so it's not just, you know, for my example, inviting our students to discover and dream, but to invite the, the partner to do that. Um, and then the other aspect of it is for new partners, you know, I, I think it's 
using the internet, it's talking to our students to see who they know that they might've worked with in the past. I mean, that's been our case in my class, um, but it's, it, there is such a need at this point because agencies are struggling that there's such an opportunity in this. And so that's where it takes a lot of work and inviting our students into that process is wonderful. And it's, I mean, it's necessary because we are, like, again, use the example of food insecurity. It is such a problem in our community here in, in the Northeast. So I just, um, I just see such opportunity in this. One thing that we've been reminding our students quite a bit is that different from most other ways that they engage with their college or university, this work isn't about them primarily. Um, our community partners needs come first and that's often something that they're not used to hearing um, because most of the work of the institution centers around them. Um, and so reminding our students that, you know, we have partners that we've worked with for 10 plus years who taking volunteers right now is just overwhelming to them. Um, you know, if you've worked at a community organization or worked with a community organization, it takes time to staff volunteers. It takes time to train them. It takes time to find projects for them to do. And sometimes that isn't worth, um, you just don't have the expendable time. And for some of our community partners, that's incredibly true. Um, we are just outside of Boston. So we also have community partners who have said like having people who don't live in this community in and out of the community is actually increasing virus transmission. We don't want you here. It's not helpful. Uh, and helping our students to hear that not as personal, but as a very real boundary. And that that's totally fine for community partners to set that and to not want to engage right now. And that they can look either for other opportunities um, or other ways to engage, but just reminding them that this work is, is structured differently than what they're used to engaging with in many ways. I also have found that um student when we sit down with students and we really start to have kind of these discover conversations of what do they care about what um what hurts them what what do they see and and, and acknowledge within their own local communities um can really begin the conversation of then how to give back to the community um i think also um allowing um pete talks about um this this community asset building of, of going in and having conversations with the community um, of figuring out what what the community is going through a lot of times we can actually find these things um, even through our news reports right like I think one for me as an example something that I've noticed within my own relationships uh, with COVID nurses is that they feel very lost and forgotten um, and so one way that we're engaging with our health and COVID alternative break is um, sending thank you letters and care packages. And um, when those are then received, they then boost the, the morale of, of that team. Um, and it's kind of fun because it's my friend who is then getting the care package and, um, and then it's boosting their, their um, ability to then give back to our community and serve our community um, as, as professionals. Alicia, what types of things are you putting in the care packages? Yeah, so we're doing we're doing letters for sure. Um, there, I actually went on Pinterest, and there's some cute, um, like survival guide type package. Um, I'm actually going to try to find the picture there. So the survival package has. Um, this like like little things like a rubber band because to tie you together or from, give me one second. I think I know what you're talking about. I think I've seen those. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so like lifesavers because you, in times when you need to be one, um, Starburst for the energy that you will need, uh, Hershey's Kisses because you deserve them from all, right? Like cute little things where it's really not you're not changing the world, but you are changing the the experience of one person who is then gonna then gonna go out and really change our world and be on the front lines. Right. It provides emotional support and encouragement. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if our panel has thoughts and ideas of how some service 
service learning, civic engagement, how some of us do it wrong or end up having a negative impact on a community. I wonder if there's things that we can then keep in mind moving forward. I'll go first, maybe. I think I think Pete really mapped it out of just how we, it can't be presented that we're going in to save the day that we're we're in community with. Uh, you know, one of the the interesting things that happens to us or with us at St. John's is that uh, some of our students we're asking them to go into their home communities to serve, and so if we are not sensitive and careful with our language, it really is un so uncomfortable and unfair to the student. And so there's a sensitivity to how we're even, even advertising or promoting our programs on the communities that we're serving and trying to be in relationship with. Uh, the way it is at St. John's is students in that first semester seminar, they have to do eight hours of service learning. Um, well, six to eight depends on the faculty. And then there's this list of all the service. So unfortunately, there isn't this opportunity for a student to maintain an ongoing relationship. It's really they're going in, doing the service, probably feeling good about themselves and then coming out of it. Uh, we need to do more with that and need to invite um, some sort of consistency. How are they using their career, their major to uh, help go back into to that, if that service is what's inspiring them or that issue is inspiring them to be an agent of change. Uh, and so that's the uh, kind of the big picture. I don't know if that always happens. I think for some students it's going, having feeling good about themselves and then going back to to their lives. I mean, pre-COVID, we do a program called Midnight Run, where we go into Manhattan at 10 o'clock at night and we bring sandwiches and clothes and interact with the, the individuals on the street and who, who do not feel comfortable going into shelters. And now our students are coming back to their residence hall at one o'clock in the morning and they feel sad, but they also feel good that they made a difference. But then what do we do with that? Like, that's always our challenge. How do we take that feeling, whatever the feeling is, and then in, and push them forward. Well, that idea of don't settle. Like now you, you're you sleeping in your warm bed tonight and someone who could be your grandfather is sleeping on the street. That does something in you. How are we through reflection, through education, moving that student forward? So it's hard, It's it, it takes probably a lifetime, but in, in the four years that we have them, uh, that's always our challenge to build upon these really strong service experiences to lead to transformation. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say one of the things I, so I um, have historically taken students to Latin America, to rural Honduras for, um, for service kind of activities. And um, well, until the risk manager at the university told us we couldn't go anymore because of, they were the murder capital of the world. So. Um, I reluctantly, you know, complied with that. But but what we would always do then, and also in, in our local communities in Appalachia, we spend a lot of time in orientation. We talk about circumstances that people might be in. We um, we pose situations where people then, you know, are in dialogue. The classes in dialogue with each other, um, and with me and a TA about, you know, sort of. Um, how they're thinking about certain issues they might get into. And that is at least to hopefully preempt some, um, some problems of, you know, coming in in some way to objectifying a community or bringing a savior complex into a community or those things that can be, I think, problematic. So we, we problematize some of the um, behaviors that, that I've seen or the language that I've heard coming up from students over year over the years in communities that might be damaging. But so a bit extensive orientation conversation before doing that kind of work in, in communities, I think is really important. Yeah, I think um, it is it's so easy for this work to be incredibly well intentioned and go terribly wrong um, in so many different ways. And so that continuous self-reflection piece, that continuous group reflection piece and self-critique is really important in this work. Um, one of the things that we often ask students, um, particularly around saviorism, 
is, could you do this work in a community of privilege? Um, and if you are doing work that would raise an eyebrow in a community that has the power and privilege to say no, you shouldn't be doing it in a community um, where you are exerting some power and privilege there. And so um, really just the, a constant self-critique reflective process um, to be able to separate intent from impact and um, think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Are we overworking our skills um, or overstepping our skills? Is, is necessary. I was going to say one thing that um, I've done with our groups is um, give them the, an essay. It's a speech um, by, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name now, a, a priest. Um, but but the it's called To Hell With Good Intentions. You can Google it. Some of you may know this, but it's about like the problems of going into in his case, he was talking about Latin America with well-intentioned and the damage that you can do in communities um, by just just coming in with good intention and not really respect for the, the culture. So I, that, I usually actually have our students read that while, while we're already, well, after we've already gone into a culture and a place and to step back and think about what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Um, what does it mean? I'll remember his name in a minute and put it in the chat box. I think Jenny might have found it. Um, yeah, and, and those were some really good questions just at the end there, Pete, for good reflective questions. Um, in, our, in our alternative break program that we do at NSU, um, we we engage in reflection as the way of making meaning out of your experience and that that's where the real learning is happening out of your experiences and out of your service work. Um, and so there was a question um, in the chat that I think will, will be a really good way to end our discussion together um, of how, what are some appreciative questions that we ask our students to deeply reflect on their learning? Um, and Amanda put a really good one in the chat um that I didn't pull up but then there are some as well like what asking asking questions like what have you done particularly well how can uh you improve on on that uh skill set that you've you've created tell me about something that you um didn't think you accomplished but did um so some of those reflective questions you can uh really use as you're both discovering the topic and reflecting on your own experience. Um, these, the, I've really used uh, appreciative education within my role at Wellesley as an intern by creating uh, the scholars reflection questions. And something that Aaron taught me as well is especially when we're talking about content um, within different communities of practice, a structure, to structure a question with um, a statement so a statement that we believe is true, for example, we believe that, that climate change is something that's happening. Um, so to structure a question um, with, with a statement that's true and then expand on that so that the question, then the students can um, really go deeper within the content that you're learning about, um, I think is something that's really been revolutionary in how I've been able to structure my reflective questions. Unless there's something, anything from the panel that you all want to end with? Any burning desires? Perfect. I think we'll flip it over to Amanda and Jenny to give us some of our offerings for the Office of Appreciative Education. Thanks, Alicia. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here for a minute. So once again, thank you panel for such, this was an incredible, um, incredible webinar. And y'all did a great job. I learned so much. I think I'm actually gonna have to go back and listen to the recording because there was such great 
uh, wisdom and knowledge and ideas shared. And thank you all for participating and putting such great ideas in the chat. Brian and I will be working to compile all of that and we will put together a resource page uh, based on all of the resources that have been shared uh, during our time together today. For those of you who might want to be learning a little bit more, please visit our website uh, where we're uh, in the process of continuing to add more information as we go. Uh, we anticipate to have some more information in the spring. We'd love to have you join our email list. You can email us at FA, or OAE at FAU.edu. We do have two online courses that we offer every uh, semester, so spring, summer, and fall. We Our registration is open for our spring 2021 appreciative advising and appreciative administration courses that are six weeks each. I think that was Savannah, uh, the dog and Appreciative Advising Institute, we will be going virtual again this summer 2021. We will have one offering in June and another in July. So we would love to have you or your colleagues participate. Please share that news. We'll have more information and we'll open up registration after the new year. For those who have either completed the Appreciative Advising course or the Institute, you then have the opportunity to apply to become a certified appreciative advisor. So that is an option. We have a number of appreciative book resources that are available and many are listed on this page. We also would love to encourage you to join or, or to, to, to access our Journal of Appreciative Education. We actually have a special issue that should be released next week that is focused on appreciative advising in the community college. And actually in February, we will be kicking off our spring webinar series with a webinar where we will have the, a panel on the authors of uh, the, the different manuscripts that will be highlighted in this uh, text or in this uh, issue. So we hope that you'll be able to join us. And then of course, we'd love to have you join us on social media. We are active on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as Instagram. So please follow us. And again, if you wanna join our email list, please email us at oae at fau.edu. Other than that, thank you all once again for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your week.